Hello and welcome everyone to our networking and connectivity cloud coaching session. Before we get started, I wanted to mention that a recording will be available after the event to view at your convenience and to please feel free to ask any questions in the Zoom chat and we will happily answer them after the topic presentation. So without further ado, I will hand it over to our cloud expert, Mark Smith. Hey, good morning, or, or I guess good afternoon, depending on where you're at. Um, as mentioned, and, and appreciate that, Tara, for, for the intro. Um, as mentioned, we're going to be talking a little bit today a little bit about networking. And I, I have here virtual cloud networks on the screen, but really what we're going to be talking about are the, the fundamental pieces that you need to know about Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, OCI, uh, in order to get everything going uh, from a networking perspective. So. Uh, of course, we're going to do this, this obligatory safe harbor statement, uh, but also important. So, um, and then here are kind of our objectives today, or this is what we're going to agenda wise, what we're going to cover. So we'll do the basics of, of the virtual cloud networks, which are basically, again, the foundation of, of everything. Uh, a little bit of a, on the IP addresses, but I'm actually going to assume here that you know uh, the basics or some of, uh, at least some of understand the IP address situation a little bit. And so, uh, if not, uh, I think that that's something that we, I can provide resources for later. But then we'll talk about the different various gateways and routing, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about peering, transit routing, and then uh, we'll close with security and then putting it all together. And, and I'll work in here a little bit of the console so you can see where all this stuff happens when we're actually in the console. Uh, so with that, let's start with the, the kind of the intro on the VCNs, is what we call them, virtual cloud networks. Um, and here, of course, is, is just the high level. It's a private network that you set up in the data center with firewalls, rules, all the specific uh, that you need for networking, including the communications gateways uh, for all the just different various situations that you will encounter when you're trying to set up your, your IT real estate, so to speak. Um, uh, important to note that it does cover a single contiguous IP4 CIDR block, uh, which you can choose. Oh, okay. And these do reside within a single region. So those are the two main points to, to, to uh, mention now. And again, like I said, I'm going to assume that you sort of understand what CIDR is. It stands for classless interdomain routing. If you have, uh, or if you, if you struggle with that a little bit, uh, I'm not really going to go into it, but on the good note, you don't have to know this really well or in depth to understand what you're doing here. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit more in the weeds than probably what we need oh. to get for anyways. Uh, so. With that, uh, I am going to talk a little bit understanding about what the IP addresses and the ranges are on your, v on your VCNs. Uh, so always best practice, you always want to avoid any kind of overlap with any of your networks. If you're setting up and you have on-premises and you have cloud, avoid them completely. Try never to overlap those as much as you can. Uh, and of course, when I start showing here on the slides, what you're going to see uh, is this representation here 10.0.0.0 slash 16. Um, this is the sort of recommended RFC, you know, 1918 ranges. Uh, and then this after the slash is probably what's going to be uh, mostly important when you get into it and start doing your, uh, your own setups. Uh, and I will note this, this second bullet point here is that Oracle OCI VCNs or virtual cloud networks have a range between 16 and 30. Uh, so, Anything outside of that is actually not supported uh, by OCI, uh, but it should be plenty because you're still within this range going to have somewhere around 65,000 potential IP addresses. So um, for right now, just remember that, that these are the ranges. Uh, and then also finally, if, if you are setting up an IP uh, range, you also need to recognize that Oracle will, will always preserve the first two and the last of each CIDR uh, so that we can use those for internal purposes. And, and uh, you know, that's kind of the routing rules that we, we need in order to have the infrastructure solid and secure and everything else. Um, so first things first, it's just a little recap. If you're talking about Oracle Cloud Infrastructure or OCI, uh, this is the underlying cloud infrastructure. So just a reminder, we are uh, separated into what we call regions. And within regions, we have availability domains. And this is the actual physical hardware and structure. These are our data centers and everything else. Uh, what we're going to talk about today are these networking, right? These are kind of virtual components that go into this. Uh, and that's why you see it in a little bit different. So this is what the VCN would look like within. Um, and each v VCN can be subdivided into what we call subnets. And each subnet can be either AD specific, meaning it can reside within one AD, or it can span the VCN. So this is what 
uh, 80 specific subnets would look like. Uh, and as you can see here, just to kind of remember, uh, this is what the IP range looks like for the larger VCN and everything that's a subnet has to fit within those. And so what we did was we created 10.0.1.0/24 and then dot two. Uh, 0 .20 slash 24 and then three and then uh, if we create one that goes across sorry I went backwards there if we go to the next level of subnet which is not a subnet within the availability domain but a subnet that spans the availability domains we would create that a second one uh, and again we had to make that non-overlapping IP addresses so that uh, there's no problems with the routings and everything else uh, so it's just important for you to know right now that it's you can do this right the uh, subnet can be in an availability domain, or it can be a cross availability domain. So it can cover your, uh, you know, your whole availability domain there. Again, each subnet has its own range of IPs that cannot overlap. I know, I know I sound like a broken record now, but that's very important and you'd be surprised how often that becomes an issue. Um, so a little bit more about uh, subnets. What do we use them for? Sorry. Uh, this is where we put our stuff, right? This is where all of our uh, instances, all of our just different, uh, uh, you know, services and everything, they, they sit within these subnets and, and within, uh, this is where all of really the magic happens. Um, and each one as it's placed. So the placement of these subnets is important because this is where uh, all of our instances will draw their IP addresses from, right? Of course, so anything that's sitting within the subnet, this instance will then have to have an IP uh, address that fits within this range that was already designated for this subnet. Uh, now, when you start looking at subnets, you can have both public and private subnets. Uh, and of course, a public subnet is just going to have both a, a private IP address, but it will also have public IP addresses uh, assigned to what we call VNICs or virtual network, network interface cards. So I'm going to be using a little bit of jargon here. Uh, if you need to, if you want to you know, jot it down there, a VNIC is a virtual network interface card. Uh, and it's it'll, it, what they use for is it's actually a component that enables your compute instance to connect to a VCN. So the VNIC determines how the instance connects uh, with endpoints inside and outside of your virtual cloud network. So with that, I'll talk just for a, just a tiny second about IP addresses. We'll talk about private IP addresses. And we start with this basic idea of the, the, the VCN sits here, the subnet sits within it, and your instance, of course, sits within there. Now, every instance, as it's provisioned in a subnet will have at least one primary private IP address designated to it on, upon creation. And I can show you where you'll see that. But there are also these VNICs or these virtual network interface cards that can be attached to the instance. And the reason why you would do that is because they also have or can have additional IP addresses added to them. In fact, they can have quite a few added to them. And these can be, again, uh, private IP addresses. So um, the first VNIC that's attached to every one of your instances will always be designated as the primary virtual network interface card or VNIC. Uh, and then anything after that will, of course, be secondary tertiary. Uh, but uh, for this point in time, again, not necessary that you understand how many they can have or exactly how to do it, but that they exist and that this is a, an important way to designate uh, connections, uh, as well as what we'll talk about a little bit here with security. So, um, uh, and, and like I said, although all of these by default have primary uh, or, or secondary private IP addresses, you can assign uh, public IP addresses to them as well. And we'll, I'll talk about uh, public IP addresses in just a second here. Um, but I also want to show you a little bit about how a VNIC works or why you would use a VNIC, right? So, if this instance already has a private IP address, why would we want to have a second or, or a third even assigned? So here's one scenario where we have one VM and this VM sits uh, in our overall region, right? So it's, it's, it's within this, this defined solid box here. That's our OCI region. Uh, but as you can see, we have two separate virtual cloud networks or VCN. So that's one, you know, one and two there. Uh, in fact, let me let me annotate this just a little bit so everybody can see kind of what I'm what I'm talking about. So, this is our our first, and this is our second, uh, and this is our our VM. And as you can see, this has one VNIC that is uh, located here or allows it to speak with subnet A. Right. This is the very basic structure. This is how you would do just a, a very basic layout. Um, um, 
Then, if you wanted to get a little bit more complicated, what you could do is you could add a second VM or a second instance that's running. Uh, but as you can see here, this one now touches or reaches into or is connected to both subnet A and subnet B. And that's because it's using two separate VNICs. So this first VNIC allows it to connect to subnet A. The second one allows it to connect to, to subnet uh, B. Uh, and again, we're, we're, we're all still within this same virtual cloud network just with subnets. Uh, and then our third option, or a little bit more complicated, would be to create a third VM or a third instance. Uh, and it still only has two VNICs or two cards, but this one actually reaches into a completely different subnet, uh, or sorry, excuse me, it reaches into a completely different BCN. Uh, whereas this one is up here, uh, this one reaches into completely separate. You can see that that's in a completely different, whole different uh, uh, v, uh, BCN there. And the reasons why you would use these, uh, you know, this second example would be used for, you know, virtual client scenarios where, where you, you know, you need to be able to, to go across, but you don't necessarily need to go all the way into a completely different VCN. Uh, whereas in a VCN, this may be something that you separated out because you have management tasks or something that needs to be completed out of this, this VCN that you don't want everybody else to have access to. So then you, you limit this exclusively to uh, really kind of like high level management or network admins or something like that. So um, now that we kind of understand how that works with the, the VNIX all sitting on top of uh, the instances, or hopefully we do, um, and just so you know, all of this is taken care of by Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. When you spin this up, when a second VNIC is created, uh, the Ethernet device is added and it's all recognized by the uh, OS as well. So you don't have to worry about doing going in and doing anything manually there either, at least at that level. Um, so. Again, I, I said, I, I mentioned that I would talk a little bit about public IPs. And this is, you know, the same diagram or the same picture because it works essentially the same way. There's no real difference here, except for that this, this private IP address, and we then, you, it's really just a click of a button. And I'll show you this in the console. Uh, they will assign a, a, a public IP address. And so everything works the same way. It's just like basically having a second, uh, second address. Um, but for public IP addresses, there, there is an important concept here that I wanted to note. Uh, those public IP addresses that you create, you can designate them as either ephemeral or you can designate them as, as reserved IP addresses. Uh, and this does have some impact because you can see an ephemeral IP address is actually just temporary. It will only exist for the lifetime of that instance. So as you spin up the instance, the instance is assigned a public IP address. And when the instance is terminated, it loses that and that IP address goes away. However, if you're setting up a, you know, kind of a complex networking uh, and you don't want to be always updating or changing your IP addresses, you don't want to be having to send it out or update it in your uh, routes or, or changing, you know, permissions or anything like that, you can reserve. And then by creating reserved IP address, uh, that IP address will actually exist beyond the lifetime of an instance and you can assign it or unassign it from that instance whenever needed. So if you were, for example, encountering problems with your instance and you had, uh, you know, just that, that VM spun up or something, you could detach it, you know, go do some work or troubleshooting on your VM or completely destroy it and spin up another one that does the, serves the same function and then just reattach that IP address to it. And then that way you're not having to go through and always change the, uh, the IP address of everybody else. Um, uh, a few points to note. An ephemeral IP uh, can be assigned to your primary private IP only. So you can only have one of these ephemeral per VNIC, uh, whereas when you have reserved IPs, you can have a, a maximum of 32. So that, that is something to consider in your, in your architect design. And finally, uh, there's no charge for these public IPs. So even if you go through and you reserve an entire range and you have, you know, say like seven or 10 or whatever IP addresses reserved, Oracle doesn't charge you extra for that, uh, even if you're not using them, even if they're just sitting out there reserved, uh, you know, kind of parking spot is blocked, uh, we're not gonna charge you for that either. So, um, and, and then these last few bullets here are just kind of a, a little bit of a, a, more information is, you know, they can be signed to instances. Uh, we actually don't recommend that you assign public IPs to every individual instance. They're just basically opens up the door 
for uh, potential problems. Uh, and if it's not necessary, then we definitely don't recommend going through and just manually assigning or automatically assigning uh, public IP addresses, unless there's a real reason for it. Uh, and then finally, those last two bullets, kind of just a little bit of an understanding of some of the services and the way that they work. So you see OCI, Public Load Balancer, NAT Gateway, DRG, couple couple jargon terms and <laughs> things that you probably don't know yet. Uh, but what I really, the concept behind it is that some of these services that are offered by Oracle, uh, they will have an actual public IP address, which you can view. And so, of course, you, you know, you need to be able to access the load balancer, et cetera. You need to, to be able to find that IP, but you cannot choose them. So upon creating, this isn't like a, the, the uh, reserved IP address where we stated earlier. Uh, for some of these services, you cannot go through and create and designate a specific IP. It will be generated by uh, OCI, and it will be something that you have to keep and cannot be edited. And so those are probably the most important points there is that uh, even if you do go in and you see it, you need to point to it and, and have something talk to your load balancer, you won't be able to go choose, choose that, and you won't be able to edit it either. And then there are a few services even that go a level further to, for increased security purposes, such as Internet Gateway and Autonomous Database, where you can't even view uh, the IP address. And again, these are all primarily security concerns. Uh, there's no reason for you to be able to, you know, if you, if you get that and you publish it somewhere or forget to lock that down, uh, it could just lead to a bunch of problems. So for security's sake, we, we definitely keep those both uh, uneditable and sometimes not even viewable. So um, I was going to go through and show you a little bit about gateways and routing, uh, but before I do that, I want to switch to the console and I want to make sure that you understand where you would find all of this. So if you were following along and you had a free trial or something like that, you wanted to sort of see uh, where all this stuff happens or where, where it works, um, spin up the console. This is just, I've, I've logged in and everything, so I've saved you all that time. Open up the hamburger menu if you'd like and you can see where you would want to go is you could go to networking over here. And I'm going to click just on overview so that I can see all of the options. Now looking within here, of course, you're going to see a bunch of things that we haven't talked about yet. Uh, uh, but what I wanted to draw your attention to is how intuitive a lot of this is. The documentation has really improved over my time here at Oracle. And I can genuinely honestly say now that I think that our documentation is really pretty good. Uh, in fact, if you were trying to figure out what you were doing here, we're, we're talking about just creating a basic uh, VCN. You could actually even expand this. And as you can see, you have a little bit of a diagram to help you understand what this looks like. Uh, and if you use this, you can, this, you'll see that this is actually a start of ECN wizard. It tells you what it's actually going to help you spin up. So it will actually help if you use the wizard. You can spin up a VCN, some subnets, internet gateway, NAT gateway, service gateway. And it's essentially a step-by-step. -step. And so all you would have to do is click onto this. Uh, and as you can see, it gives you a few warnings that you kind of understand a little bit. This is where you would designate your CIDR block. All you'd have to do is put in here a name. Uh, and then as you go through here, uh, you know, you, you, uh, you can do some advanced tagging and things like that. But uh, as you go through the steps, just gives you kind of a review, kind of helps you understand. See, all this stuff is already done for you. They've already created public subnets. Uh, they've already put all that into play. Uh, and then here, they're also going to even create some gateways. Now, I'm not going to do this uh, because a couple of these concepts are something that we're going to be focusing on in a second. Uh, however, I wanted to give you an idea of what it's going to ask. I, I find that as I learned OCI, I went in here, I would walk through some kind of click through demo and I would see all of these different things. And then I would show up on this page here where I'm at now and I would say, okay, but what is my, what is my security list supposed to look like? Right? How do I even know what my security is, is, list is supposed to look like? Uh, and I don't want you to become overwhelmed with it, but I just want you to understand what exists here. And then we'll, we'll go back out of here, back into the presentation a little bit and show you what the concepts are behind these so that you know what to do when you do run into the security list and look at it and say, okay, now what do I need to do? Um, so with that, I'll, let me hop back in over here. If I can get there, there we go. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the different gateways that you'll need to, to understand uh, in order to really make your networking work. So again, we're starting with kind of the basic diagram here. Here's our, our region. Here's our availability domain. And we have one VCN provision or created already within that. Within this, just for this example sake, we're going to create a regional public subnet. Uh, and we're going to put one instance with a public IP inside there. Of course, by definition, uh, the public subnet, of course, has 
Um, now let's say that we're using this, we have a public subnet and we want to speak with the internet. We need to go out to the internet or we need the internet to, to come in, right? So we need to enable traffic that goes from this subnet out to the internet. So what do we need to use and how do we need to set it up? Well, the answer is what's called an internet gateway, which is uh, uh, not very original, but aptly named. Um, this provides a path then that you can use uh, for traffic back and forth. Now, this is important as the next kind that we're going to talk about is called a NAT gateway. And how that differs from the internet gateway is that with the internet gateway, um, traffic is two-way or bi-directional. And when I say that, I don't mean that traffic is flowing back and forth. I mean that either side can initiate the traffic. So the internet can initiate a session through this internet gateway into our subnet and talk to this uh, instance here. And our instance can do the same. It can initiate traffic that will then flow out to the internet. Um, you can also only have one internet gateway per VCN. Uh, so uh, just keep that in mind. Um, and we'll talk about this in just a second. Once you create one of these gateways or once you create one of these kind of routing paths, you always have to be considerate of what the routes look like. Uh, and we'll talk about that actually on this next slide because in, to, enable, to really enable that traffic to flow, you have to create uh, a specific route within what we call a route table. Um, and let me show you what that means here. So in our same diagram here, if you're talking about all of these pieces, where you would put your route table, was it exist, it can exist right here on your actual subnet and that's what this, this graphic here represents. It's used to send traffic out of the VCN. So think of this almost like a little map. It's a, it's a rule or a set of rules and each rule specifies a destination, CIDR block, as well as the route target. And when we say route target, we're really only talking about the next step or the next hop that it will take. So for tra traffic that matches this CIDR or the CIDR that we designate, it will tell where that traffic needs to go. Uh, and what does that look like? It looks just like this. Uh, this is exactly what it would look like actually. And in fact, um, if I were to go back to here, uh, you can see this, right? This is what the, the security lists and, and the route table down here would look like this, right? So <clears throat> this is what we're actually talking about right now is how do, how do these routes actually work uh, and what do they look like? So, sorry about that. So within this, then what we would say, uh, and just to help kind of, uh, you know, translate what's going on here, what we're saying here is 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0 .0 slash zero is essentially any address, right? We're saying any traffic, Anything that comes in here that has this listed as a designation or anything listed as a designation will be routed then to our internet gateway. So this is what we were talking about, that this is our route target, it's our next hop. So now that we have this list, uh, this entire subnet knows anything that enters the route table, it will quickly do a check and it will say, okay, any and all traffic that comes to us will then hop through this internet gateway. So it's a really simple way of, of showing it. Uh, but really what we're saying there, all, any and all traffic is destined and it's going to go right through that internet gateway. Uh, and the reason why we're not saying something more specific is because, in, you know, fundamentally, networking only generally tells you the next hop. So again, it only will get you to the internet gateway and then we rely on the, the internet gateway then to do any more routing or anything that's needed on that end. So first concept is the internet gateway. Most important thing to remember, it's bi-directional in, in, in traffic, but it also means that traffic can be initiated at the internet and at the subnet level. So from either end, the traffic can be initiated. Um, and then, uh, sorry, we just went through this, right? But uh, here's uh, something you also want to know a little bit about the route table. Um, you only need to use this if your destination IP is not within this pre-existing VCN, right? Because anything internal, uh, Oracle OCI automatically understands and will be able to find. And so if there's traffic that needs to be within the VCN, you don't need to worry about the route table. However, um, um, each subnet uses a single route table. And even though it's created or you can specify what it, it is at, at the time of creation, you always have the option to go back in and adjust or change those routes and those rules. So, um, and then this last point, when you add any of these, Again, you must update that route table. Uh, 
because if, if you don't tell it where to go, let's say, for example, you know, we had something else in here, uh, an IP address that ended in slash 16, and there was a range that didn't fall within there, then it wouldn't do anything with it. It would just fall into a black hole. And so your traffic would never be routed to anywhere else. So always go in and, and make sure that you're updating these route tables whenever you add a new component or a new uh, way of routing that traffic. So the next type of a gateway that we're going to talk about is what we call a NAT gateway. Uh, same basic structure here with our diagram, only this time because, uh, well, for reasons you'll see in a second, we're going to actually use a private subnet. Uh, and so we're not talking about any kind of public IPs or anything like this. Uh, and this is the instance inside of that subnet. Now, we still want to connect with the internet here, but we want this to be very different. The NAT gateway gives what we call, it's a private network access to the internet without assigning each host a public address. So what does that do? Well, that means that basically this is, it, it's still bi-directional traffic, but traffic can only be initiated on our end or from the subnet end, right? So we could start that or initiate that traffic and we could send out a request to the internet and receive a response back. Right? So that's what this second bullet says, but we cannot receive an inbound connection. So therefore the internet cannot create the connection. Uh, nobody, nobody from the internet or from you know, the web would be able to reach in uh, and access that subnet because the, the nature of the NAT gateway is such that it only allows that one way initiation. Uh, and of course, anything that comes back and, and uh, why you would use this if you had, for example, uh, updates or patches that needed to be applied. Say that this was, you know, for example, maybe a, a database or something like that that's sitting there. Uh, and you need to update, update to the latest version. Well, then you could set up a, a NAT gateway. There's no reason for anybody to be, you know, hitting that one uh, with anything else. So all you're going to want to do is you're going to want to reach out, grab some of these patches and updates and pull them in. And that's it. So you would use a NAT gateway very secure uh, and, and by design locks out anybody from initiating that traffic through the internet. Um, this is what the route table would look like, very similar to what we talked about before. Uh, all traffic, any traffic that we're doing again is then going to be routed straight to the, the NAT gateway and the NAT gateway will then give it its next hop. So you can have more than one NAT, NAT gateway on a, a VCN, though a given subnet can route traffic to only a single NAT gateway. So although they can, they can sit out there multiple, uh, you need to definitely be careful with uh, the way that you're routing that traffic. So um, now that we've talked about internet gateways and NAT gateways, we're going to talk about what we call a service gateway. Uh, again, same basic structure. We're going to have a, a private subnet and a private instance sitting within. Uh, and a service gateway lets resources within that same virtual cloud network now access public OCI services, such as object storage, without having to, to traverse the internet or use one of these other gateways. So the difference here, the big difference here is that before we were always talking about external traffic, right? We're talking about going out to the internet, we're talking about and going into the, the wild west. With the service gateway, the idea is that you're only ever going to be accessing something that's still within the Oracle network. Uh, so one of these public services, we call them sometimes Oracle or Oracle Cloud Infrastructure public services, such as object storage, uh, and so you don't need to go out to the internet. You don't want to expose yourself to that kind of a thing anyways. You know, this will be faster. It will be more secure. So it looks like this. You create what's called the service gateway. Uh, and then instead of, you know, going off into somewhere else, you just go, you go outside of your VCN uh, and you connect to this object storage here. Uh, and any traffic from a VCN that's destined for one, you know, the supported OCI public services uses the, the private IP address that we talked about before for routing. Uh, and it travels again over this OCI network fabric, never traversing the internet. Uh, and these could be, again, the use cases are kind of listed there, but if you need to back up your database system and all that data then, and push it up to object storage, this is a perfect example of, of when and how you could do that without ever having to put that data out there. Uh, lots of people have, uh, you know, just security concerns or, or even sometimes regulatory or compliance type reasons uh, for doing this, but this is the, the best, most secure way to do it. And also probably the fastest as well. Um, for the route tables here, uh, they look a little bit different when you write up the route table here because what you do is you actually write in the service label. So this object here, whatever you're trying to connect to, will have a label and then you can just simply use that in your destination 
uh, your uh, route table there. And then of course, as soon as uh, anything in the subnet sees that, the route table will say, all right, we're gonna route this through the service gateway and get it on its way. Um, oh, whoops, sorry about that. Um, and this is what they would look like right here. So this is how you would actually designate that or, or what the syntax would look like is you would say OCI and then your region and then object storage. Uh, and that's what you would write in there to your, your destination cider. So, all right, so the, the final kind of uh, routing or gateway that we're going to be looking at is what we call a DRG or a dynamic routing gateway. Uh, and again, same basic setup. We're gonna have our, our subnet sitting in here. Uh, this time we're going to connect to something a little bit different. Instead of keeping it within the Oracle private uh, cloud or, uh, or putting it outside of to the internet, we're going to use a dynamic routing gateway for something that's neither of those two. Uh, most common use cases, we're going to connect to a data center, an on-premises data center. Uh, and that's what this says up here is, is, you know, between your VCN and a destination other than the internet or this internal private stuff. Uh, and you use this, uh, this DRG connects to either a VPN or IPsec VPN tunnel or a fast connect, uh, which is dedicated connectivity. Uh, but you still need this router in order to, to handle the traffic and tell the traffic where to go and what it's doing. And this can be obviously bi-directional also by design. If it's not going out to the internet, it can be, or it will be more secure uh, and will probably be faster as well. So after you attach this DRG, you, again, you have to create, create and, and provide a route table to enable the traffic flow. And this is what that would look like. Uh, so again, you can just write whatever the destination is and then it just goes to the DRG and you're, you're, in, you're in good stead right there. Uh, Interesting to note too, that a DRG is a standalone object. Uh, it, you have to attach it to the VCN and it's a one-to-one -one relationship. So there's, there's, no, there's no way you're gonna have three or six of these or anything like that. It's, it's a one-to-one. -one. Um, and then you may be asking then, well, what do I do if I have a question or a situation where um, I need to connect multiple VCNs? That's what we call peering. Uh, and there are two types of peering. There's local peering, which was within the region, and then there's remote peering, which we'll talk about in just a second. So again, this is the process of simply connecting these multiple VCNs. So if this is what we're looking at, right? Two different VCNs. And again, this is the same region. We're gonna use what's called a local peering gateway. It is a component on the VCN, and you'll need one for each VCN, right? Uh, and so uh, you create one on, on, uh, on the VCN2 and you create one on the VCN1 and then you enable that traffic flow. Uh, and then you have to write, of course, a route table for both, right? So in, in both of these scenarios, um, what you're going to be doing here is, so just to explain this, VCN1 has traffic and the traffic needs to get to this IP address, 192.168, right? So the, south, or the, the route table will look like this. This is our destination, right? So anything that's trying to get here will then be routed through our local peering gateway number one. And the same thing in reverse, right? But only, we already have our IP address. We obviously aren't going to talk to ourselves. So we're trying to reach this IP address, 10.0.0. whatever set 16. And so our route table then tells us if this is the destination, then we know that anything from our subnet is going to be routed through this LPG local peering gateway two which will then automatically get it to a local peering gateway one. And again, I'll repeat it. Uh, this is where the overlapping um, ciders or IP addresses can be a real big problem. So make sure that you're just creating uh, IP addresses and blocks that do not overlap. Now that was uh, a, a, the local peering, right? So we're within a region. This is what it would look like. Uh, the remote peering is across regions. So it's a little bit more complicated uh, mostly just in, in the provisioning of it. The, the theory of it behind it is actually really quite simple as well. Um, on this one though, because we are going across regions, instead of using a local peering gateway, we're going to use a DRG, which we already talked about before is a dynamic routing gateway. And then we have one on both VCNs. So VCN1 has a DRG and VCN2 has a DRG. We also then create what we call a remote peering connection or an RPC. And I, I know that there's a lot of jargon here. I'll provide these slides and so that you guys can have, uh, you know, an opportunity to go back and sort of uh, revisit what all of these mean and, and when they're used. Um, 
But the RPC's job, of course, is to act as that connection point. Uh, so these two remotely peered, uh, the DRGs will then run over this RPC. And as noted there, this is, uh, that traffic does go over what we call the Oracle backbone. So this is actual Oracle infrastructure that's been laid. This is, this is hardware. Uh, so the, the connections and everything there are secure uh, and created and maintained by Oracle. So what does the route table look like for these? Very similar to what we would look at before, right? We're trying to reach this destination from VCN1. We're trying to get to 192.168. And so then our route table will look exactly the same, only we route to the DRG as opposed to an LPG or something else. Once it gets to the, the DRG, the DRG pushes it across. Uh, same thing for our other side, right? Uh, and you can see, just this is in the Oracle uh, Ashburn uh, region, which is, uh, you know, Virginia, uh, and then our, our Phoenix as well. Again, no overlapping. Um, so those were our peering scenarios. And then I'm going to quickly try, jump into what we call transit routing, because, uh, you know, sometimes we run into a little bit more complicated scenario and lots of, um, actually lots of customers have asked me about this exactly. Hey, do you guys do hub and spoke? Uh, for those of you who don't know what the jargon is, I'm going to explain it right here. Uh, transit routing is you set it up in such a way that your on-premises network is connected to a single VCN, and then that VCN then branches out and reaches into others, right? So there are two scenarios here, and let me show you. So again, uh, I'll, I'll, try and, I'll try and do this here. Um, this is everything on-premises, right? We're trying to get to, and we're trying to get into our cloud environment as well. So what we do is we set up one hub VCN with the DRG, and so then we have all of those same connections that we talked to before. We have, you know, everything going back and forth. Um, and then what we do is we actually set up local peering between our hub VCN and each of the spoke VCNs. Uh, so this is, uh, as it looks a little bit more complicated, you're setting up one DRG and then you're setting up three different local peering uh, connections as well. Um, but, uh, this one here, this hub VCN is really only working as a, as a router, so to speak. Uh, it, it's locally paired with these others and all that it really does is it handles the traffic as it comes in and then it points it to the right directions. Uh, so as you can imagine, uh, you know, the route tables here are going to be a little bit different, a little bit more complicated for this hub VCN. Um, and then just to remember for this point is the VCNs must be in the same region uh, but can be in different tenancies. So if you were, if you're trying to connect to different regions, that's where we would use not local peering, but remote peering. Uh, oh, here, let me clear my, my, my markings. Um, and uh, just so we finish that out, um, if, if we're looking at this, the, the route table that's associated with the DRG can have only rules that target an LPG or a private IP. So you can only then route to a local peering gateway or to a private IP. Uh, and the route table that's associated in reverse, so the local peering gateway can only have rules that target the DRG. Uh, so uh, the dynamic routing gateway. Uh, and they, they can exist without these rules, but if you want to actually allow the traffic to flow, you have to follow those two first rules there where we're talking about uh, the DRG can only point to the LPG and the LPG can only point to the DRG as well. So this is what that route table would actually look like. And if you, if you are trying to follow this uh, example, let's say from the left, um, let me get my, my pointer back here so I can share. Uh, all right, technical difficulty, I'm not gonna be able to annotate, but essentially what we're looking at is if you look at that diagram from the left to the right, that flow, so, Imagine some, that the traffic originates in the on-premises network and it wants to route all the way to the spoke VCN, uh, the IP address 192.168, et cetera. So the first thing that we're going to look at is the uh, route table for the first hub VCN. And in it, you can see that there's a rule that says 192.168.0.0/16. That's our, hope, our uh, spoke VCN. Uh, and the hub VCN knows that as soon as it sees that IP address, it's going to route to the LPG1. Um, but there's a second rule in there for the reverse traffic, right? So let's say now that the spoke 192.168 is trying to speak the other way. So the traffic flow then is now from right all the way left. So that's why the destination 
CIDR is 172.16, et cetera, because that's what we're trying to reach. That's our destination point. Uh, and then our spoke VCN, as soon as it sees that it knows that it needs to, or our hub VCN, sorry, our hub VCN knows that as soon as it sees that IP address, it's going to route for the dynamic routing gate. Um, so hopefully that uh, makes sense. And I've locked myself with my mouse. I don't know where it is. Uh, Sorry, a little bit of, uh, there it is. So let me get rid of this and I'll clear those annotations and I'll move to the next one. This is then what the spoke VCN uh, route table would look like. And you can see there are two different targets there. One target is the hub VCN, that's the 10.0 slash 16. Uh, and then there's the on-premises network of 172.16. And you can see that the route targets are the same because all of the traffic is then routing through the LPG number two. And so for that spoke VCN, it's actually a pretty simple setup, right? We know that almost all traffic, any traffic essentially now is going to be route through that way. Now, of course, the DRG has to have a route table as well. And because this is primarily handling traffic that goes back to the on-premises network, uh, or sorry, it's, it's handling both, right? It, it handles the incoming that comes from the on-premises network and going through. And that's what that destination site is of 192. That's our spoke VCN. And so then it routes it through the LPG1. Uh, and then our LPG1 actually has a route table as well that will route. And again, uh, that one is, is showing the direction flow from the right to the left, right? So anything from the spoke VCN coming in, as you can, and you can see that by the designation of the, the destination cider block, which is 172.16. Uh, and so then our hub VCN knows that as soon as it has a call for 172.16, it then will route to the dynamic routing gateway. So I know that some of these can get complicated and you have to account for each direction of flow of traffic uh, and understanding, you know, computers don't really just guess. Uh, you have to tell them explicitly and, and clearly where they want to go and what they need to be doing. Uh, but so hopefully that helps understand a little bit about the, the routing and the peering as well. Um, and then just a couple rules is that uh, if you're going to and you want to then do this sort of transit routing, but you want to speak to Oracle these public services that we were talking about. Typically, we would use what we would call uh, is the service gateway, right? Now, one important thing to note when you're setting this up, you can still set up the hub and spoke and everything else works the same, except for that when doing this, this service gateway needs to be set up for each, both, both of the spoke VCNs as well as uh, the hub VCN as well. Uh, so, uh, this is what we call transit routing and, and the theory or the concept is is that this on-premises network would only need to hit the hub vcn and then uh, sorry about that and then it would essentially route its traffic from the hub vcn through the spoke vcn to the oracle services network that does not work that scenario that i just described where the on-premises routes through the hub and then through a spoke into the oracle network does not work what you would have to do is you would have to set up this service gateway so that it connects the hub VCN directly. So if your on-premises network wants to attach or wants to access the Oracle services network, it has to have a clear flow and it has to have clear connections all the way through with route tables and everything else attached. It cannot transit route through one of these spokes into the Oracle services network. Because hopefully that makes a little bit of sense too as well. Uh, and that's why you would, in that case, need three separate service gateways instead of just having the two on your spokes. Um, so in summary, I know that I, we <laughs> just covered a lot of ground. So let me just kind of go through it. In, in this scenario, uh, reading you know, from top to bottom, let's say you want to only connect to the in, your instances to the internet. You want them to also be able to receive full connections, not just traffic, but actual connections from the internet. You need an internet gateway aptly named because it lets you, you establish a connection with the internet and the internet to establish connections with hosts uh, in your network as well. The next scenario is where you want some of your instance to be able to reach into the internet and establish the connections, but you do not want to facilitate the internet to do the same, right? You want traffic to still flow back so you can still get patches and updates and things, but you do not want the internet to be able to initiate those connections. So in that case, you would use a NAT gateway uh, and that locks it down so that only you can be the initiating party. 
third is a service gateway that lets your virtual cloud network hosts privately connect to the Oracle public services, such as object storage, bypassing the internet completely. We use the Oracle backbone here and the infrastructure that we already have in place uh, and uh, very good way to do it again for security and, and other reasons. Um, fourth scenario, let's say you want to extend um, OCI to your on-premises network and you just wanna have easy connectivity from everything that you have already on-premises uh, into your cloud. So you, maybe you did disaster recovery or backup or something like that in the cloud. Uh, in this instance, you're going to use the DRG, which is the dynamic routing gateway, and you will have to pair that with either an IPsec VPN tunnel or a fast connect tunnel. Uh, and those are kind of beyond the scope of today, but uh, we can talk about those in a later session. Uh, and then finally, if you're privately connecting to two VCNs in a different regions, you're gonna use remote peering, uh, and then local peering, sorry, I skipped, uh, which is if you're connecting two VCNs in the, within a region as opposed to across regions. Now, I know we're kind of running short on time, so I'm going to, to run through the security portion and just make sure that we understand. There are what we call routing tables, right, which tells the, the traffic where to go. There are also security lists, which essentially act as firewalls. And within each subnet, you can then attach rules that says either allow this traffic or do not allow this traffic. Uh, now, Oracle by design is actually created uh, as a, uh, it's, it's secure by default. And so the overlying principle is that everything is locked until you open it. So these security lists are very important because if you set up a subnet or a VCN and you do not include any rules in your security list, nothing will have access. Even if you set up a routing table, it will still be blocked from the security angle as well. So there are rules that look very similar to a route table, that, that, that first bullet point there, it specifies the traffic in and out, everything that's allowed. Um, so, and then you associate that on that second bullet point uh, with the subnet. And you can either do that during creation or you can alter it later. Uh, and um, let me go to the next slide because I think this will help, but you can choose whether a given rule is stateful or stateless and I'll, I'll talk about what that means. Um, but this then is kind of a visual representation of what those would look like. You can see those little shield icons there are attached. And this is what our security list looks like. It tells us, you know, we have an ingress rule, which is incoming egress is outgoing uh, and it tells us of course the cider and the protocols to use and then it actually tells you we can do them you know on these ports um, but you know not to complicate things I don't want to go into all the details um, this there's a way to do that where you can group them all together so instead of having to write individual security lists for every single one of your pieces in there if you have resources all sitting in the same uh, you know subnet or in the same VCN and they have the same security posture, meaning you want them to all have the same rules. You can actually create, you can attach it at the, at the VCN level, or uh, you can attach what they, or you can create what they call uh, network security groups or NSGs. And these security groups are the set of rules and you can attach them to the, to the VNIC or to the virtual network interface card. So let's say for example, in this scenario, you had these three sitting here, uh, but you wanted uh, subnet, a, uh, our first, you know, the, the leftmost, if you wanted this VNIC and this VNIC to have the same security postures, you could create an NSG and you could attach it to these two and leave the third one out so that it had a different posture. So that's where, uh, and this is actually recommended best practices is typically is to use uh, a, a network security group uh, because it does allow you then to remove your security lists and rules from the VNIC or from the subnet itself, but you can actually attach them to each individual piece. So uh, Oracle recommends that as kind of a best practice. Um, all right, and then of course, uh, I kind of built that out, but uh, just I know I'm rushing a little bit because I think we're running out of time, but this is kind of what you would look like in terms of writing those rules. This is what they would look like uh, so that you could designate that traffic as well. So, uh, you can use both interchangeably or you can use both concurrently, I should say. So if you are creating a security list uh, and you want to use uh, a network security group, you can, uh, but you need to remember this, this last point is, is probably the most important here. The packet in question, so how do you read those rules, right? If you have a, a security group and a, a security list, what happens when you have three or four or five rules? Well, the packet in question is allowed in if any of those rules would allow it on their own. 
So if you have a rule specifically written in security list one that allows traffic to come in, that traffic will always come in. Even, even if you were trying to keep it out by some other route, if, if you go in and you, you open it up, that traffic will always be allowed. So you, there's not like a tiered approach where they're gonna say security list one beats security list two and security list one beats the, the network security group. That's not the case. If there's any rule in any of those that allows the traffic, the traffic will go through. Um, and then, so the difference between stateful and stateless is uh, pretty, pretty easy actually. Basically what this means is that th there's a feature called connection tracking. When an instance receives the traffic matching this, this rule, the specific stateful rule, the response is tracked and it's automatically allowed to leave. And that's why that in that diagram there, you see the second arrow is kind of a dotted line is because you don't have to write a specific rule for that. Uh, the connection tr tracking keeps track of what the request was as it came in and it will allow that same traffic to leave, you know, providing whatever it was that was asked for. Um, uh, default security rules are uh, stateful. And, and this is what they would look like if you were going to console and create them, right? So, um, and there's just a little checkbox next to it that's not shown in the graphic where you can check stateful or, or stateless. So, um, uh, and then this is the stateless, right? Which is just the opposite, which means that, that there is no tracking. And so if the traffic comes in using that top arrow, right? All ports comes in, it goes into port 80 from host B into instance A. Well, then you have to write a specific rule to allow the traffic to leave at that point, right? So it, it won't uh, automatically track it. It won't keep track. You have to write a specific rule. Um, and you would use this, of course, uh, if you didn't want that connection to be, uh, you know, through like that if, if you wanted to. Uh, and, and there are good scenarios in which you would probably, you would want to do that. So let's just put it all together. Um, uh, and and I'll, I'll finalize here, uh, you know, a couple just points to remember. Subnets can have one route table, multiple security lists. Route table defines uh, what can be routed out of a VCN. So think of that as a little map that shows all the traffic where it's going. Uh, private subnets are recommended to have individual route tables to control the flow of traffic outside of the VCN. And then all hosts within the VCN can route to their other hosts with no kind of rules required. Right? We talked about that as well. And then security lists don't manage necessarily the routing of the traffic, uh, but they manage the connectivity. Right? They allow, uh, they, they will specifically lock down or stop that uh, unless it's been opened for that purpose. Uh, this is what, what I was talking about. It's called the whitelist model, uh, where we lock things down by default and you always have to go through and open them up. Um, and uh, instance cannot communicate with other instances in the same subnet unless you permit it. So even at this point, it's, it's locked down, right? You still want to be able to write that rule and to let it, the communication happen. So, and as I think I mentioned this already, so I'll, I'll skip past that. And uh, visually, let me do this then. So for this scenario, we have a region, we have an availability domain, uh, and we have our VCN with a two subnets in it, a front end uh, and a back end. And within those, we have, you know, an instance, uh, and, and maybe a database down there. Uh, and then we're gonna have a security gateway. And we're also going to have our route table on the subnet, the front end subnet. And then we're gonna to have to have the same thing obviously on the second subnet, so the back end subnet. Uh, and on this scenario here, right? If we wanna to speak to the internet, we, we write our, our route table rules and we write our internet or we create our internet gateway connection so that we can then speak to the internet. Uh, we can use some local peering there to go from our front end to our, our back end. Uh, and then if we don't want to allow the traffic out, right, this is, this is where the transit routing comes through. It will not work because we, we're not routing through that as a spoke or, or uh, so we would have to create that. If we wanted to allow that traffic from uh, the back end uh, subnet, we would actually have to create that ourselves. And this is what the route tables would look like for all of those different components, right? So to go to the internet, we don't care, all traffic is going to go out. Uh, but then our security lists then are going to have to be written to allow that as well. And then on our backend server, we're only ever going to be going to the, the service gateway or the peering gateway or whatever it is. And so then we don't want to really, our, our security table, right, our security list, we don't want that to be expansive because then it would allow traffic we don't want to have. So um, in summary, these are kind of the topics that we talked about and that we covered uh, and uh, you know, Sorry for, for rushing towards the end there. I, I guess I got a little bit more content, but uh, 
wanted to remind you we are going to have uh, another session here and hopefully these are, are helpful. We're really going over OCI fundamentals and next time we'll talk about compute. So we'll learn a little bit about the different kinds of compute instances, what shapes they are, uh, how they work, what, you know, throughput and things like that, you know, performance as well as uh, shapes and things like that. And of course you can see those here. And, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll share these slides. Um, uh, in general, we're doing this as an Oracle Cloud Coaching Clinic where we're doing a one-to-many, but if you ever run into a situation where you feel like, hey, I need somebody to help walk me through that personally, individually, we actually do have a program called Oracle Cloud Coaching where you can get one-to-one, -one, uh, basically just one-to-one -one help, right? You can sit down with the technical engineer at Oracle and they will help walk you through and all those actions you see on the right, you know, if you need a workshop or maybe even just some sample code or you need somebody to help you walk through a couple of hiccups that you've had while you're configuring your service call us or, or, or better yet, click on that link uh, and, and contact us and let us know what it is you're in need of. And we definitely would be happy to help you there. So uh, with that, let me, let me stop. I know that that was a lot of me talking. Uh, I appreciate your patience. Uh, and uh, if there's anything else that you want to wrap up with Tara, um, let's go ahead and do that. Or if maybe there's one or two questions that we could sneak in. Great, thank you. Um, yes, it looks like we do have one question on Phoenix. So um, we do have some time for that. Can go ahead and read it off. So the question is um, states, I understand a primary private VNIC is associated with a subnet and it's optional to utilize a public VNIC per each private VNIC. But what I'm not understanding is how VNIC is related to private versus public subnets and how are VNICs leveraged exactly? Are they essentially unique IDs for subnets? So, uh, yeah, so that's a good question. And uh, uh, yeah, probably didn't explain that as, as well as I should have. So each instance or each entity is going to have its own private IP. Uh, however, in order to get a public IP, what you want to do is you want to attach a VNIC, which is uh, mimics uh, the on-premises versions uh, of a network card, right? Just a virtual network card. And so that virtual network card then allows the communication, uh, you know, and, and that's where you would attach the public IP address. And because you can have multiple VNICs, you can then also have multiple public IP addresses that were coming in. So the traffic will be routed through that VNIC to the instance itself. Uh, so, um, so the question, you know, related to private versus public subnets and how are VNICs leveraged exactly? Are there essentially unique IDs for subnets? Yeah, you, could, you can think of it that way, I think, if I'm understanding the question correctly, yes. You, you, each VNIC then has its own IP address and then you can be you know, it can go through there and, you know, where you would want to do this is potentially where you want to route traffic a certain way. Uh, and so, for example, let's say you have three VNICs that are sitting on your instance and you're going to route traffic to those specific IP addresses that hit each of those. And then you could have a different security list on each of those as well. So if you know that, uh, you know, you're, you're wanting to attach to a certain instance or you want to, uh, sorry, let me say that better. If you want to access a certain instance, but you want to limit it, by the the person requesting, right? So let's say if you have your database on your back end and you want to allow users to access it, but you also want to allow your instances uh, themselves, the actual services uh, to attach to that same database or to access it. Now you would probably write your security rules uh, and your routing rules differently for each of, each of those, right? So you know that the service, let's say you have an instance that's going to be accessing and, and querying your database, you can write your security posture and your security list or your um, you know, security gateway uh, in a way that allows that traffic, uh, but maybe uh, you have different rules that are set for your other you know, users, general users. Uh, and you could route those through different VNICs and then give those different security postures there so that would sort of differentiate it out. And then you could keep track of, or maybe you wanna watch those logs and pay more attention to what the users are doing uh, versus what that instance is doing when it accesses your database. And so th that's a, a kind of a good, a good use case for the VNICs. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll dig up a little bit more. Um, maybe I can, I can find a little bit better documentation that's a little clearer on that. And, and I, can, I can send that out when we send out the slides as well. So hopefully that answered that. Okay, good. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was worried there that I was maybe just rambling on and not helping at all. But uh, hopefully that, that helps as well. So, um, all right. I think that that puts us basically right at the bottom of the hour. Uh, I appreciate all you, like I said, all your patience. I appreciate you all being here. Um, and uh, if you have any feedback for us, please let us know. Feel free to, you know, reach out and, uh, uh, you know, leave feedback and say, hey, this is too basic. We want to see something more. We, you know, we want to talk about Java or, or OKE or whatever it is. If you have 
uh, topics that you'd like to be covering or you want me to go to a little bit different direction, just uh, feel free to let us know. We're, we're here to help you out and uh, help you understand OCI a little bit better. Uh, with that, Tara, is there, is there anything else that you wanted to add? That's everything. And thank you all again for joining us. And we hope to see you again next time. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you.